Thanks for watching. Forgotten Battles is also available in podcast format on iTunes, Google Play Music, or your preferred podcatcher. If you would like to support the show, please visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash Forgotten Battles. Also, please rate and review the show on your preferred platform, or feel free to leave us a comment. In January 1945, the Soviet Union launched a massive offensive in Poland. In weeks, they shattered the German forces there and drove to the banks of the Oder River, a mere 30 miles from Berlin. It was the Soviet Union's most lopsided victory of the war, since they lost at most 150,000 men while inflicting 450,000 losses on the Germans. <laughs> Upon reaching the Oder River, the Soviets suffered a breakdown in discipline and logistics. The Red Army was primed for revenge and eager to carry out reprisals in return for German atrocities. In the coming months, two to three million Germans, Poles, Hungarians, and others were murdered by rampaging soldiers. The collapse in discipline made it hard to control units, and some advances stopped as the men indulged in theft, murder, and rape. In addition, the flow of supplies broke down, particularly since Posen, a major railroad hub was still held by the Germans. The Soviets were also afraid of a repeat of Kharkov when Russian forces advanced too far forward and were destroyed in a German counterattack. The Soviets stopped along the Oder River to reform their forces. Meanwhile, Joseph Stalin, leader of the Soviet Union, was having a falling out with Georgi Zhukov, Russia's premier military commander. Zhukov was ruthless, brilliant, and seen as the author of the Soviet Union's impending victory. Although his forces were stretched, Zhukov believed that with one more push he could have Berlin before March. Stalin, though, favored the plan put forth by Ivan Konev, Zhukov's rival, which called for the city to be encircled. Stalin was paranoid and feared Zhukov's power and popularity. As the Soviet leaders debated their options, a sudden thaw turned the ground into mud while the Oder River became swollen from melting ice. In addition, Zhukov had to spend the first days of February readjusting his lines to plug in gaps. On February 8th, Stalin ordered a halt in the Berlin Offensive, with the Western Allies still stuck along the Rhine River. There was no chance of them suddenly taking Berlin. Instead, Zhukov was to clear out Pomerania, although he still hoped to be in Berlin by March 1st. The Soviet attacks near the Oder in February suffered heavy losses with few gains. The Germans were aware of Soviet atrocities and fought fiercely, trying to buy time for civilians to escape. The rash of Soviet atrocities also led to Hitler's last burst of popularity. He positioned himself as the savior of Germany. When news arrived that the Allies planned to give part of Germany to Poland, Hitler said, So much for the drivel talked by our coffeehouse diplomats and foreign ministry politicos. Here they have it in black and white. If we lose the war, Germany will cease to exist. What matters now is to keep our nerve and not give in. Like Stalin and Zhukov, Hitler also had a tense relationship with his top general. Heinz Guderian had popularized tank warfare in the 1930s and convinced Hitler to support the creation of Germany's famous panzer divisions. Guderian put his ideas into practice with brilliant victories in Poland, France, and Russia. 
Although a superb tank commander, Guderian was vain, arrogant, and selfish. He often took credit from others and was difficult to work with. In December of 1941, Hitler removed him from frontline command due to complaints by fellow officers. Guderian was made chief of staff of the army in July 1944. Guderian was not one of Hitler's toadies, but he was generally supportive of Nazi policies. Guderian, though, was suffering from heart trouble and high blood pressure. Hitler, for his part, was ill and often took various drugs. Both men were in poor health and had short tempers. It made for a combative relationship. Guderian wanted a major offensive aimed at cutting off the lead Soviet forces in Pomerania by retaking the city of Kustrin. To do this, Guderian wanted to attack with the 6th Panzer Army and the 11th SS Panzer Army in a double envelopment. Hitler, though, sent the 6th Panzer Army to Hungary. The nearby 3rd Panzer Army also could not help since it was under attack. The 11th SS Panzer Army would attack alone, although it was still forming up. Most of the units were seriously under strength, and some divisions had no more than 1,000 to possibly 2,000 combat soldiers. Although standards had relaxed considerably, Waffen SS units were still generally well trained and highly motivated. In addition, the Waffen SS promoted mutual respect and a more relaxed atmosphere between officers and men. In terms of promotion, the Waffen SS was far more egalitarian than the army, which still favored Prussians of noble birth. Also, by 1945, Roughly 40% of the Waffen-SS was foreign. 11th SS Panzer Army included many men recruited from Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and even Spain. Most were motivated by anti-communism and anti-Semitism, which were often conflated. Guderian wanted the offensive to be overseen by Walter Wenck. He was the youngest general in the German army and an experienced staff officer. Hitler admired Wenck's honesty after he told Hitler... As you see, my Fuhrer, the Eastern Front is like Swiss cheese, full of holes. Guderian admired Venk's drive and diverse staff experience, although he was untested in independent operational command. Instead of quickly agreeing with Guderian's desire to place Venk in command, Hitler went on a two-hour tirade. Guderian described Hitler as having his fists raised, his cheeks flushed with rage, his whole body trembling. He was almost screaming. His eyes seemed about to pop out of his head and the veins stood out on his temples. After the argument, Hitler finally told Wenck that he would oversee the attack. He then looked at Guderian and with a smile said, Now please continue with the conference. The general staff has won a battle this day. In addition to getting Wenck for the command, Guderian also had the offensive start date pushed up in order to gain surprise and relieve pressure on the port city of Danzig. The operation was codenamed Huzarent, translate as Hussar Ride in English. The SS, though, had the name changed to Sonnenvenda, translated as Solstice in English. Although Wenck had overall command, much of the battlefield choices we made by Felix Steiner, commander of the 11th SS Panzer Army. Steiner was a decorated veteran of World War I. He was a hardcore Nazi and considered one of the best Waffen SS commanders. He was aggressive, brave, exacting, and popular with his men. He also had pushed for making the Waffen-SS a pan-European force and was therefore a good choice to lead the diverse 11th SS Panzer Army. On February 14th, an exhausted Guderian visited Steiner and Wenck and made it clear that surprise was necessary. The main offensive was to be delivered in the center by the 3rd SS Panzer Corps, which would rescue the German garrison at Arnswald, then turn towards Kustrin. The corps comprised the 11th SS Panzer Grenadier Division Nordland, the 23rd SS Panzer Grenadier Division Nederland, and the 27th SS Panzer Grenadier Division Langermark, and the Fuhrer Begleit Division. Both Nederland and Langermark were under strength, but Nordland and Fuhrer Begleit were two of the best units in the Third Reich. Arnswald, the goal of the center attack, was held by a mixed garrison led by Hans Voigt. Days before, the Soviets offered Voigt generous terms of surrender. When asked to hoist a white flag at St. Mary's Church, the Germans instead flew the Nazi party flag along with the old imperial banner. The Soviets answered with a seven-hour artillery barrage. The town should have fallen, 
but the garrison included Tiger II tanks of the 503rd Heavy SS Panzer Battalion. The Tiger II was a massive tank, and therefore bad in urban combat, and even worse in muddy terrain. Yet its armor, firepower, and habitability made it a weapon without equal in either army. The Tiger IIs at Arnsvald had good fields of fire and wreaked havoc with the Soviets. Two attacks would anchor the flanks as the 3rd SS Panzer Corps pushed south. To the west, the 29th Panzer Corps would operate in the area near Lake Madu. It was made up of Panzer Division Holstein, the 10th SS Panzer Division, the 4th SS Panzer Grenadier Polizei Division, and the 28th SS Grenadier Division Wallonian. Holstein and Wallonian were under strength, but 10th SS Panzer Division had over 80 tanks, the most of any formation in the attack. To the east near Landsberg was the 10th Corps, the weakest attack force. It was made up of the Fuhrer Panzer Grenadier Division, the 104th Panzer Jaeger Brigade, and the 163rd and 281st Infantry Divisions. Although the 163rd was really not yet in position, all told, Steiner likely had at most 50,000 men with an estimated 300 to 400 tanks and assault guns. While the Germans built up their forces, Zhukov and Stalin expected an attack, but they were unsure of when it would come. As such, Soviet forces prepared some defenses, but without urgency. To the west, there was the 2nd Guards Tank Army, and the 61st Army in the east as well as the 1st Guards Tank Army, 47th Army, and the 3rd Shock Army in reserve. The 61st Army was led by Pavel Belov. He was one of the Soviet Union's best defensive commanders, and he had led 61st Army since June 1942. His army would take the brunt of the German attack. The Soviet formations were exhausted from weeks of moving and fighting. In addition, although Soviet tactical training was much more improved since 1942, it was still insufficient. Tactics were simpler, and officers did not usually take the initiative. Nevertheless, morale was high, and the Soviets were unlikely to give ground easily. On February 15th, the Nordland Division opened Solstice with a direct drive toward Arnsvald. Nordland achieved total tactical surprise and sliced up two infantry divisions and made it to Arnsvald that night. The opening moves of Solstice were a complete success. On February 16th, the general attack began. To the west, the elite 10th SS Panzer Division and Holstein Panzer Division shredded the 12th Guards Tank Corps at Lake Madu. However, neither division could link up with the rest of the 29th Panzer Corps, so a chance to create a pocket was lost. The advance of the Wallonian division at Lake Plone was tepid despite hard fighting. Surprisingly, 10th Corps made good progress to the east against considerable Soviet anti-tank defenses. 61st Army managed to hold on south of Arnsvald, even as Nordland was reinforced. Belov attacked Arnsvald, hoping to destroy the garrison before Nordland could solidify the position. The Soviet tanks moved better in the mud, but the Tiger IIs had a good position and turned back to Belov, who also lacked artillery and infantry in the area. Zhukov quickly sent reserves into the fighting, including several heavy tank battalions. They were armed with IS-2 Joseph Stalin tanks. They were heavily armored and durable and had a powerful cannon. However, they suffer from a slow reload time. On February 17th, the offensive bogged down. The Germans still made local gains and inflicted heavy losses, but Steiner's men lacked numbers, and the mud made offensive tank operations difficult. The Second Guard's tank army halted German attacks in the west. Arnsvald came under renewed attack, but the Soviets could not get past the suburbs. That night, Wenck went to Berlin to report to Hitler. The briefing dragged on, and when Wenck left, he had to drive his car since his driver had not slept in two days. Venk fell asleep at the wheel and crashed the car. He suffered broken ribs but survived. Ironically, after the war, he died in a car crash on May 1, 1982. Command went to Hans Krebs, an experienced staff officer who had served in the German embassy in Moscow before the war. Krebs lacked Venk's energy and imagination and was considered a Hitler crony. On the 18th of February, the Germans were attacked all along the front. They had held their own, but it was clear the Soviets had brought up their reserves. In Arnsvald, Voigt, 
and Martin Unrein, commander of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps, decided to evacuate the civilians and the garrison. This signaled that the Germans had given up on even holding their modest gains. On February 19th, Zhukov began an offensive to seize Stettin and cut off Steiner. Heavy street fighting continued in Arnswald, but Soviet tanks were lost in large numbers. By February 20th, Voigt's command was evacuated. On February 23rd, the Germans withdrew towards the Ena River. Many vehicles and equipment had to be abandoned, but the Soviets failed to detect the retreat. Not until February 25th was Arnswald finally occupied. By February 28th, the Germans were positioned around Stargard and Stettin. Guderian was disappointed by the results of Solstice, but Hitler was pleased with Steiner's spirited conduct. Solstice failed in all of its objectives, except for the rescue of the Arnswald garrison. However, it caused a series of bitter recriminations in the Soviet high command. Stalin upbraided Zhukov for being taken by surprise and his failure to destroy the 11th SS Panzer Army during the Soviet counterattack. Combined with stalled offensives at the Oder and in Pomerania, it was decided to halt the drive on Berlin indefinitely. Stalin opted to have Pomerania cleared while the forces in the Oder were built up for the Berlin offensive. In the end, Solstice had unwittingly bought time for the Third Reich, not through any great military success, but by giving Stalin an excuse to delay the drive on Berlin. Solstice also gave Stalin a pretense to diminish Zhukov's power within the army and ensure that Zhukov would not be a post-war rival. Third Reich's day of execution was merely delayed. On April 16th, the attack on Berlin opened. Losses were heavy, as the Germans used the weeks bought by Solstice to strengthen the defenses. The result, though, was preordained, and Zhukov's artillery started shelling Berlin on April 20th, Hitler's birthday. By then, Guderian had been replaced with Krebs, who desperately tried to coordinate a relief effort. Hitler and Krebs relied on forces led by Wenck and particularly Steiner, Hitler's new favorite general. On April 22nd, as Berlin was encircled, Hitler found out that Steiner could not attack and save the city. He went into a rage and declared that the war was lost. Days later, the last passage from the Nazi high command was broadcast. It read, Where is Wenck? The answer would not have pleased Hitler or Krebs. Wenck was attacking towards Berlin, but not to save the city. He told his men, Comrades, you've got to go in once more. It's not about Berlin anymore. It's not about the Reich anymore. Wenck's men attacked to save thousands of Germans from the Soviets and were successful. Meanwhile, Hitler committed suicide in Berlin, followed soon after by Krebs. Among the units trapped in Berlin was the Nordland Division. It was destroyed in the fighting, with a few men escaping west to the Americans and others hiding in the ruins of Berlin. Shortly after the war, Soviet and Polish authorities forcibly expelled the surviving German residents of Pomerania, Silesia, and East Prussia. Hitler had promised the German people an empire that stretched into the east. Instead, land that had been German since the Middle Ages was given to Poland as compensation of the German-Soviet invasion of 1939. Arnswald, which lost 80% of its buildings during Solstice, was rebuilt with austere Soviet architecture surrounding St. Mary's Church. In 1946, it was renamed Koshno. 